three, two, one. Here we go. Welcome to System of Soul. Chris White and Benj Miller coming at you today. And uh, I know I say this a lot. We're really excited to have our guest, but we are really excited to have our guest today. Um, our guest is uh, Tim Elmore, and Tim is the founder of the nonprofit Growing Leaders, and he's also, I guess he's an accomplished author. Let's see, Tim, you're at number 37. So Tim, uh, Tim is a very accomplished author. His book, Habitudes, has sold over 2 million copies. And uh, he's got a new book coming out called The Eight Paradoxes of Great Leadership. And uh, Tim, welcome to System and Soul. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be with you guys. Well, we listen, we, there's so much ground to cover here. And we really want our audience to get to know who you are and what you do and how you do it and why you do it. So why don't we, if you don't mind, kind of giving us that um how did you become Tim Elmore and write 37 <laughs> books? That's a great question. Well, um, I guess the skinny on that is I, I began my career a long time ago, so I have been around a while. Uh, and um, I spent most of my career with Dr. John C. Maxwell. So many uh, readers would recognize that name. He's a best-selling author in leadership. But all the while I was working with John, I was always the next gen guy. You know, okay. here's how we understand and make sense of the emerging generation. Yeah. John was teaching business leaders who were 48. I was thinking, how can we get this to people who are 18? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, Growing Leaders is really a nonprofit about helping, uh, helping people lead the next generation, whether they're a teacher, a boss, uh, an athletic coach, uh, or whatever. So that's really what we're, what our, um, I think, forte is. And I always say that a little hesitantly because I don't think anybody's got a total finger on the pulse, but we try to keep our ear to the ground. We research and we try to give tools to leaders to better lead the next generation and prepare the next generation to be a leader as well. So what are some of the things, trends you've seen as, as you've been doing this, the next generation's constantly evolving, right? Yeah. So you, you can't be an expert for too long without reinventing what that looks like. That is so true. What, what, are, what are some of the big shifts that you've seen? Yeah, good question. Well, there's a handful. Uh, one, confidence is morphing into caution. Um, the millennials came through and probably, I think millennials would even admit this, probably overconfident, you know, they were, you know, we're going to change the world by noon on Friday, you know, that right. sort of thing. And um, I think Gen Z rightfully so has been very, very uncertain about the future. We're sitting in a pandemic a year and a half after it started. And so I even, I even had a high school student recently say to me, Dr. Tim, I'm afraid to dream. And I, I felt that for him. I, wow. he was going, I used to make plans. Now I don't know how to make plans. Yeah. So very, very cautious and uncertain, even though I think as, as young people, they're still hopeful. They're still, they're very, very uncertain. Yeah. So that would be one. Um, spending money has morphed into saving money. And you can see why that might be. The Gen Z has watched millennials accrue the largest tuition debt in the history of America. Yeah. And so they're going, I don't want that to happen to me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, attacking an education is morphed into hacking one. So millennials just bought into what mom and dad said, which was just go to college and you get a great job. Well, many of them went to college and the great job didn't open up right away. You know, they had yeah. to move back home. So Gen Z is now hacking their way through their post-secondary experience, mm. uh, taking a couple of MOOCs here, uh, get a mentor there, an internship there, and they're just making up their adult life so far. Um, so, is that a positive or a negative? Well, I think it's a little of both. Um, I think, this is my opinion, I think too many go to four-year liberal arts colleges that shouldn't be in college. And it's not because they're stupid. It's just because that four-year liberal arts college wasn't designed for them. They should go to a trade school. Right. Uh, they should learn yeah. to be an electrician and make you good know, money. You're, yeah. you're hitting the nail on the head. Uh, my, my, uh, my best friend growing up from in Chicago, um, uh, he's a PhD college professor, and he loves this subject because he's been in it thirty years, right? Yeah. And and he he he'll he'll flat out tell you, more than fifty percent of those kids probably should have went to either a JUCO, 
yeah. for two years, go to a junior, get yeah. get get a little bit uh, uh, more confidence under your under your academic <laughs> life and discipline, and then come to a university to finish it off because yeah. he's been watching it, you know, for thirty years, all the different you know the gens, and. Um, he 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 one hundred percent agrees with you. Yeah, Try school or yeah. or or take a gap year and go get a yeah. job. Yes, mm-hmm. that's that would be helpful to millions. Oh, uh, can of, you imagine the impact? Yeah, yeah. Both yeah. of my kids went uh, did a gap year, and yeah. it so helped them when it was time to get ready now for the next step. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I have dear friends that um, have a son named Eric who was a 4.0, all, 4.0 GPA all the way through his K-12 education. So they naturally sent him off to college. And uh, Ben, he went to Auburn University. You have lived in Auburn. And uh, his freshman year, mom and dad are on the phone with Eric and they say, well, how's it going? And they could tell he was less than passionate. And he said, well, it's, it's going okay. And they go, what do you mean just okay? Well, in their conversation, he goes, I'm not liking this at all. And it wasn't because he was not smart enough for a college. That's right. And they, and they actually asked him, uh, Chris, they said, what do you want to do? He goes, I want to work on cars. Yes. And they go, I didn't, they went, I, we didn't know that. So they right. took him out of Auburn, sent him off to a school that got him ready. He owns a, an auto shop, oh. you know, yeah, I know. I love it. Cars, having the time of his life. And the problem is we Americans say, well, you're not successful if you don't have a college degree. And that is not true. Um, I say you find your gift and go go after it, whether it requires a liberal arts university or not. Eric's parents are my hero. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That yep. is how you parent. Yeah, I agree. So good for them. They did exactly the right thing for their child. That was that's an amazing. That's a great story. Hey, podcast listeners, Chris White here. I want to challenge you with something today. Now this might sting a little bit. You ready? All right, here it is. Are you limiting your capacity as a leader? We know your experience in the world of business, entrepreneurship, and leadership development. We know you're smart, intentional, business savvy folks, but are you playing too small? One of the greatest steps you can take after years of leading a company or organization is to become a coach for other businesses. I've been a business coach for over 20 years after a 20 year corporate career. And I'm here to tell you, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. It is the most rewarding and gratifying thing that I have ever done in my career. And this is also why Benj Miller and I created System and Soul. We're training coaches right now to help small businesses everywhere experience breakthrough in both the system and the soul side of their business. If you're ready to expand your capacity and create impact like never before, then let's go. Get on my calendar, let's book a call, and I'm happy to introduce you to System and Soul. For more information, visit systemandthesoul.com forward slash coach and set up your phone call today. Tim, talk about 37 books, but Habitudes is the one that you've been known for until people get a hold of your new one, which we'll get to in a minute, but um, give us, give, give, we'll see if we can sell a few more books. Cause this, okay. this, is, one of, this is one of those books that um, obviously a lot of people have bought, but for a good reason, because it's so helpful. So talk us, talk to us yeah. for a minute about the habitudes. Yeah. Habitudes. Um, that's a funny word, but it's actually a real word of the dictionary. So for us, habitudes are images that form leadership habits and attitudes. So we've combined those two words, habits and attitudes. We just believe, especially the emerging generation needs to develop healthy habits and attitudes. So we wanna build a new generation of leaders that will lead a different way. And it will be about solving problems and serving people, not about power. Um, So each habitude book, there's nine habitudes books. Uh, Each Habitude book is is, uh, filled with 13 images, each of which represents a timeless principle that you and I would look at and go, yeah, I wish everybody knew that, you know, or learned that in school or whatever. So um, we just have found that they have struck a chord with both the adult leader and the the kid that's coming through high school or college. So... um, I, uh, I raised my children at dinner time talking about Habitude before they were published. 
And uh, it was so much fun because pictures are worth a thousand words and it got engagement from my kids. Uh, pictures beat lectures every time. And I just said, well, let's, let's look at a picture and talk about what it means. And, and each one represents a principle. So it's been really fun. I'll, I'll stop there, but I've had so much fun using metaphors to teach principles and right. see them transferable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I even love, I mean, you just simply threw it out there, but leadership is solving problems and helping people. Um, I, I love that definition. I mean, I just, yeah. kudos to you because there's so much that gets lost in what is leadership. And, yeah, and I, yeah. I like the focus on those two things. So take us to the eight paradox of great leadership. I'm, I'm assuming there's a little overla- overlap with the um, habitudes, yeah. but where, where did this come from and what are we getting in for? Yeah. Um, thanks for asking. I would say the, the impetus for eight paradoxes happened a few years ago in a green room, right before a, an event, a conference, So I was sitting back there in this green room with 16 CEOs, different industries, but all leaders, men and women. And I thought, I'm going to turn this into an instant focus group right now. (laughs) So (laughs) I tossed out the question, do you think leading today is harder than it was when you first learned to lead? And I was shocked. I, I thought many of them would say yes, but every single one of them to the person said, absolutely. One of them said 110%. And then I kind of volleyed back by saying, well, now that's actually strange that we would all think this because wouldn't you think it's harder to lead when you didn't know anything about leadership way back, you know, when you first mm-hmm. you know, were in your right. But everybody stuck to their guns. They said, no, it's harder today. So that sent me on a research hunt. I decided I'm going to find out why everybody seems to think this is true. And you all would agree. We just live in very, very complex times. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you saw it, but Fortune magazine last year came up with a a feature article called The Great CEO Exodus of 2020. Dozens and dozens and dozens of CEOs. Disney, Hulu, IBM, I mean, just crazy. They were all leaving. Now, granted, we had a pandemic starting in 2020, so that might be one of the reasons. But I think many just said, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I just can't do this anymore. So this eight paradoxes book is not the only answer. It's not the only show on the, you know, on the, on the, on the block or the only book on the block. But um, I began to dig into the fact that leaders today need to have social and emotional skills that we didn't need when I first began my career. I mean, it was beneficial, but today they're, they're essential. Yeah. Uh, it's exhausting to lead today. People come with greater levels of an education, greater levels of expectation, Greater levels of exposure. We all have a smartphone. I can find the dirt on anyone, even my leader. So they're coming in as armchair quarterbacks, you know, saying, I'll tell you what to do here. And leaders are going, what are you doing? You know? So anyway, all of this leads to a very, very complex time that I don't think we need to step back. I think we need to step up. And I think these paradoxes are, are, are some guidance to step up. All right. So tease us. What are a couple of them? Okay. Yeah, I'll give you a couple of minutes, but let's chew on them. I'd love to chew on it with you. So the very first one in the book is, I think uncommon leaders are both confident and humble. So usually you get one or the other. Isn't it true? You get an overconfident leader that going, oh yeah. my gosh, you're not that good. You should yeah. be that confident, you know, or you have a very, very humble leader, which is appealing. But if you get a humble leader and they're only humble, you go, I don't know if we're going to get to our goal. You know, <laughs> thanks mm. for being humble, but I need somebody saying, let's charge the hill. Yeah, I think when you combine the two, it's beautiful. So let me give you my case study on this chapter, Bob Iger. So Bob Iger now chairs the board at Disney, but he just stepped down last year as one of those CEOs of the Disney enterprise. When Bob Iger stepped up as the CEO of Disney in 2005, 2006, he replaced Michael Eisner. And if you all know anything about Michael Eisner, he was a very, very good leader, but he was very... His ego was big. Can I say that respectfully? A little bit cocky and arrogant. In fact, he and Steve Jobs had been in dialogue about Disney buying Pixar. Right. And they, they just were two egos butting heads. So the board at Disney asked Michael Eisner to step down. They, they said, you're fired. Well, Bob Iger steps up. And Bob Iger is this beautiful combination of confident and humble. But Bob says in his autobiography, I had never led anything like Disney, you know, that sells 
theme park tickets and plush toys and animated movies and live action movies and television programs. So Bob said, I stepped in and I had to learn from the very people I led. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. The first thing I did was listen. I said, you guys got to explain this animated movie thing. But he said, at the same time, I had to have some confidence because I, I got to add, here's what we're going to do. Tim, I just I just flipped your your first paradox. I put it in reverse. Humbly confident. Ooh, I love that. That's exactly what he was. That's what you're describing. Yeah. So here, let me distill this into a single sentence. I think uh, confidence makes our leadership believable. People need a confident leader, but our humility makes our confidence believable. When I'm humble, they see I'm human and I realize yes. I don't have all the answers. Yeah. When yeah. we combine both, oh my gosh, it's beautiful. So yeah. that's, sure. that's, that's uh, paradox number one. So Tim, what, what Chris and I do is we help businesses bring what we call system and soul into the business. Mm, so it's a, it's a paradox. Like what, yeah. I'm, I'm resonating with what you're yes, saying. Yes, you are. Yeah. And we have this conversation a lot because most leaders either lead by system or they lead by soul. Mm -hmm. And when you bring both of those in together, the system uplifts the soul and the soul yes. uplifts the system. So it's very much what you're saying. But one of our, our uh, I guess, observations is that most leaders are naturally inclined toward one of those and yeah. have to really work at the other. Is yes. that what you see yeah. with this humbly confident piece? No doubt about it. In fact, on all eight of these paradoxes, you tend to lean a little bit more toward one or the other, if not a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I'm loving is Harper Collins, the publisher, and it's a John Maxwell imprint, by the way. Uh, so it's definitely a leadership book that's along his lines. Harper Collins put together a quiz so readers can take a quiz and go, oh, Here's why I'm strong. Here's why I'm weak on, on these paradoxes. So oh, that's super fun. fun. Oh, that's great. Right. We'll make sure that's in the show notes because I think I think that's yeah, gonna yeah, be that fun would be fun to look provide at. a link to that. Yeah. It, it's interesting though. Let's let's be a little vulnerable. Uh, Chris, are you more humble or more confident? Confident. Yeah. 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 That's why we're a good yin yang. I probably am more humble and I'm I'm working on. Um, I'm, I'm internally confident. I'm working on my external confidence. Yes, there you go. So, there you go. That's good. I what are you, you were... more inclined toward, Tim? Well, before I say anything, I want to say, Ben, are you humble? Are you humble and proud of it? <laughs> yeah, I'm the most humble, Tim. <laughs> 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 no, I'm so I'm totally kidding. Um, I think, um, I tell you what, I think I probably err on the side of confidence and decision makings until I get into a brand new area. And then I'm going, Oh my Lord, you know, and, and, and that's probably very, very natural. Yeah, but that's, that's the, you know, you, 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 you have the confidence in the things that you know best, the things yes. that you have experience yes. with and a history with. Yeah. But when you get into that new situation, like you're describing, um, you know, your unique ability and you yes. also know your limitations. So, and when you go into that new arena, you do come in with this humble mindset because yeah. you know you're about to learn a bunch of new yes, stuff. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's really true. So here's an illustration. Going back to the Bob Iger case study, remember I told you Michael Eisner and Steve Jobs hit an impasse and just stopped talking? Yeah. So Bob Iger takes office as the CEO of Disney. Some, some months pass, he kind of gets acquainted with everybody, but he contacts Steve Jobs. But this time the leader says, Steve, it's Bob Iger. I don't know if we've ever, I don't think we've ever met. I have a crazy idea. I think Pixar is amazing. I think Disney is amazing. I just can't help but think we might be better together. And Steve Jobs' response was, that's not a crazy idea. But I think his humility was winsome. Yeah. You know, we're drawn yeah. to humble. Yeah. In fact, we want to make up for all the stuff you're not saying, you know? So I really love, I love, I just think this is a timeless principle. Humility is always winsome. And when we couple it with confidence, who knows, we might change the world. That's awesome. All right. Give us another one. Okay. This is a very counterintuitive one. I think uncommon leaders leverage both their vision and their blind spots. Now, we'd often say, oh, you don't want to have blind spots, but isn't it true? We all have blind spots. Every single human being in the world has blind spots. I think great leaders leverage both of them. So my case study on this one is Sarah Blakely. 
Mm. Uh, many of your listeners might know her name. She was the founder of Spanx. Sure, amazing. Streetwear yeah. industry. She kind of invented a whole new industry. Uh, she she cut the feet off of nylons, and boom, a whole new industry was. Yes, there. that's right. Amazing. Yes, yes. I, I have never sport. tried. Them. Yeah, I've never tried them on, but I hear this. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So here's, and that's the point. So here's what's cool. She's a graduate of Florida State, 1993. Uh, she starts selling fax machines door to door in to companies. Well, she's wearing nylons and high heel shoes, and this is not comfortable in that hot Florida sun. Yeah. So she starts, you know, the cutting them off and realizes I may be onto something here. This girdle pantyhose thing combined. So she she thinks I've got to find somebody that can make these. She goes up to North Carolina where there's a lot of manufacturers of pantyhose but they're all run by men. So not one of them sees any merit in her invention, except for one guy who has two young adult daughters that when he showed them to his daughters, she go, they go, dad, this is awesome. You should do this, you know? And so of course he goes, okay, Sarah, we'll, we'll manufacture these. Well, now Sarah needs to find a distributor, but instead of going to trade shows, which that's what you do, she calls up an executive at um, Neiman Marcus and says, can I get 10 minutes of your time? She gets 10 minutes, which is not much. She goes up to a female executive at Neiman Marcus, starts talking, knowing she only has 10 minutes. She gets five minutes into her time and she realizes I am not getting anywhere because this lady gets pitches, you know, dozens of times a day. Yeah. So she stands up, Sarah, that is, stands up and says, would you follow me? And the executive goes, what do you mean? She goes, would you follow me into the restroom? Sarah walks her into the restroom, tries on her Spanx, does a show and tell, sold right then and there. <laughs> so Neiman Marcus decides to put it in like a dozen stores. Sarah brilliantly calls up all of her friends that live in those cities where those stores are <laughs> and says, I'm going to send you some money, buy them out, buy them out. And so they're bought out. Well, then rest is history. Now, here's the paradox in, in, in play. Later, Sarah is doing quite well. She does a conference, speaks about this, and does a Q&A. During the Q&A, all of the people in the audience go, how did you get a department store to notice you in a big trade show with thousands of vendors and exhibitors? And she goes, trade show? I didn't go to a trade show. And Sarah would say, even to this day, it's what I didn't know. It was my blind spot that helped me get to my goal. How many times have leaders said, if I'd known then what I know now, I would have never done it, or I would have never known. I would have never. It was our very blind spot that actually helped us get to our goal. And I actually think that's what most entrepreneurs would say. And most people developing new products and services would say, thank God for the blind spot. So Here's the here's the, the paradox. How do you leverage that rather than make it your enemy? It's your best friend. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah, that that yeah. one, that one I would, you know, uh, there's a lot of conversations around <laughs> humbly confident, but the fact that your blind spots can actually be beneficial to your yes. vision is interesting. So so do we stick our hand in the sand and say less blind, more blind spots, the better? <laughs> Well, well you, you, you asked. You know, I was going to say so interesting. We we're talking about the, the blind spots. So I'm in session yesterday with a client, and we needed to we needed to call an audible and go off of the agenda because um, they had a couple pressing issues that could take the day, and. Um, this is a, a leadership team that is um, fairly new, uh, getting to know one another, um, and they're building trust. But so something was said that triggered me to kind of stop everything and say, you know what, everybody, I'm going to take you through a really quick exercise. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down all of your teammates down on the left-hand side of your paper. And at the top of the paper, there's two columns. One column is um, what a positive attribute that you really respect about that person. Yeah. And then the negative. I want you to I want you to 
I want you to tell them something in their blind spot. And you know what? At first, people were like, uh, <laughs> one positive, one negative. And I'm like, well, you know, in the, in the realm of business and what they do, but think of it as something in their blind spot. They all shared something mm. with each other in their blind spots. And every single person said, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So here's what I think the secret is. In the chapter, this particular chapter of the book, I talk about how do we make rookie smarts work for us our entire career? You know, the term rookie smarts, we've all, you know, we have that usually in the first year of our career. Maybe, we hope. Yeah. But um, I believe, I've, well, I've tried to distill just looking at great leaders that I've watched who have started things or began, you know, launched new products. They maintain rookie smarts well into their 50s and 60s. Uh, I mean, Truett Cathy started a new restaurant at 92, you know, so yeah. uh, it's just crazy. But uh, anyway, I think that's the key. Clearly, we need vision. There's no doubt about it. You, every leader needs a vision. But I think the great ones, they, they, they go after their vision and they leverage those things they don't know in a blue ocean strategy. That was a great book when it came out. You're not swimming in the red ocean that's read from the blood of all the competitors in your industry. You're in a blue ocean where you've started something all new and nobody's even in there with you. That's what I think we've got to do as leaders today. What does it look like to maintain rookie smarts? I, I'm, I'm familiar with beginner's luck. I haven't heard yeah. rookie smarts before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, first of all, you, you know, most of us, I, I already alluded to this once, but most of us would say, had I known then what I know now, I might not have ever started. So part of it is just the energy and the zeal and the passion that goes, I'm working till midnight on this thing, you yeah, know? Yeah. And well, there's, a, there's a level of naivety too. Yes, that's part of it. Yeah. And sometimes, would you not agree? Sometimes that naivety is, is a good thing. That's, a, that's, that's a right. Good thing. That's right. Yeah being childlike in our, in our zeal and passion. Um, but I think the rookie smarts works for us when we find people outside of our industry. And by the way, our industry is locked into a certain way of doing things that can say, oh, here's what we do that you might not have ever tried. So I'll tell you the classic illustration here, we all know it, but let me just use it as a picture. Um, a young entrepreneur, 37 years old, sold his tech company in California way back in 97, celebrates with his wife by watching a, 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 a movie, uh, Apollo 13. Uh, they, they rented it at Blockbuster Video. We remember those places. If you remember the story of Reed, he loses the video cassette. When he finally returns it, he's got this huge fine. On his drive home, he's thinking two things. One, how do I tell my wife we just got this big fine for a late video return? <laughs> but he secondly thought there's got to be a better, better way to do home entertainment. And this guy, Reed, Reed Hastings, comes up with Netflix. And by the way, he saw it even in 97. Netflix. It's on wow. the Internet and it's a film. Yeah. Well, he takes the idea to Blockbuster and they go, nah, we got this. Well, what they had was video cassettes. Uh -huh. They didn't realize the mission actually was home entertainment and there might be a whole new way of doing this. Well, right now, Blockbuster is a dinosaur. They're out. And Netflix is doing quite well. So I think part of it is he actually borrowed from an entirely new industry that was still new in the 90s, the internet. And, sure. and Blockbuster thought they were in the... Blockbuster missed the fact that they were in, the, they were in a bar, bigger uh, pool than they thought they were in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. I'd love to do one more. One more. Let's hit one more. Yeah, we got to have another one. Okay, let me think here. Well, uh, the one that just popped into my mind is um, <laughs> I think uncommon leaders are both stubborn and open-minded. And this is akin to the, the other two that I shared, kind of a second cousin. So my, my uh, case study on this one was indeed Truett Cathy. I just brought his name up. <laughs> So listeners, I, you probably know that name, but if you don't, Truett Cathy was the founder of Chick-fil-A. So back in 1946, he starts his own restaurant with his brother. His brother passes away. He had all kinds of things go right. Fire in the restaurant. There were so many reasons for him to quit, just like we've had this last year. But Truett keeps on going. He has one restaurant for 10 years. 
but he gets his recipe down, not just for chicken sandwiches, but for his values, what he believes in, what's going to be timeless. And I believe uh, Truett Cathy came up with something that, that we all now are thankful for, you know, the Chick-fil-A restaurant. Uh, they are just outgrowing McDonald's and Subway and Chick-fil-A makes more money per unit than Starbucks, Subway and McDonald's put together. Wow. Put together. That's, in, that's crazy. It is privately owned, no, no, not publicly traded. So here's what every executive told me that I interviewed, including Dan Cathy, his son, Tim Tosopoulos, Mark Miller, David Salyers. It was just crazy. They, they all agreed. Yep. Dan Cathy said, my dad was both, well, he didn't say stubborn. He said, uh, he said, uh, what, what was it? Open-minded, strong-willed, open-minded, strong-willed. That's a yeah. more respectful way to say it. I love the word stubborn because I paint such a- Call it what it is. <laughs> that's right. That's right, man. It's stubborn. Own it. It's stubborn. Yeah. So he was so stubborn on what he would not change, yeah. but he was so open on what he would change. So I think leaders need to enter- the business, what's core that I will die for. And then, then I'm open on everything else. In fact, the everything else is a way bigger category than the core. So you all know this. One of the things we know Chick-fil-A for is closed on Sunday. Now, yeah. whether people agree with that or not, and by the way, many don't agree. That's the right. number one sales day of the week for many fast food restaurants. But Truett said, nope, you're not going to work for me on Sunday. You're going to be home with your family, maybe in worship, but you're not going to be working for me and it blows me away. what's that it blows me away what, what, because does it didn't isn't he in your new stadium in atlanta yeah and on an nfl game day he's closed when that stadium is full yeah, yeah with fifty thousand people there amazing uh, i'll tell you something that's really strange that most people don't know when truett kathy along the decades has heard of one of his chick-fil-a operators opening up on sunday just to generate more revenue He'll drive up to Tennessee or wherever they are and fire them on the spot. Wow. I know it. Wow. I know it. Lovingly, but firmly, you're done because they didn't embrace the values. So Truett knew his core. And I, again, every leader would say, yeah, I know, I know, I know. We need to do a core. I think we're so much into um, bottom line revenue. We sometimes compromise our core in the name of, of revenue generation. And I oh, just- 100%. And yeah. it's such a- a domino effect on the soul side of the business, right? It is. And yeah. then you, not, now you have retention problem. You mean it just, it's a domino effect. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, and can I speak about the soul part real quick? So yeah. I heard so many stories about Truett. I couldn't even include them all in the book, but one of my included was this one. Dan Cathy, his son, started working for his dad at the restaurant when he was a teenager. And one day, Truett, the owner of the store, said, Dan, I want you to get a ladder out and I want you to put it against the restaurant and climb up on the roof. I keep hearing noise up there on the roof. So Dan told me, he said, Tim, I was a teenager, but I did what my dad said. I climbed up the ladder and he said, when I got up on the roof, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of beer cans and they all knew who it was. Charlie was the night manager that was a bit of an alcoholic and they all knew that Charlie was a drinker, but Charlie would be there alone late at night, chug down a six pack and throw the beer cans up on the roof, thinking nobody would ever notice. Well, Dan told me when I, he said, Tim, when I climbed down the ladder, my thought was, well, there goes Charlie. You know, he's, he's out. He's out. Well, he, Dan got emotional. He said, my dad walked in and said, Charlie, Let's go to AA together. And uh, he made sure Charlie stayed and got through the process. And Charlie retired as the night manager still stayed at that restaurant. So part of Truett's core was your people, your people, your people. So yeah. he'd fire a guy if he didn't keep the values, but he'd work for a guy who, uh, who needed help. And I love that's the soul part, isn't it? Uh, that's oh, the soul yeah. Part. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, and, and so, to your point earlier, that that right now, Gen Z, right? That 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 that's what they want. I know it. It's so true. They want somebody that's human, that, yes. that loves me. Yeah, and we've got to embrace that. You know, uh, 
Daniel Coe's book, right? Culture Code. What's the first yeah. thing employees want? Psychological safety. It's so true. Yeah. It's so true. I love that guy, by the way. Daniel Coyle is yeah. the man. Mm. Uh, so Truett just put on a clinic every day about, you know, what's the core and what's, you know, what's yeah. adaptable. And, and uh, oh my gosh, I, I, I still, I got to go to his 90th birthday party. It was a big party, but oh, uh, it was a clinic on how to live a life. Man. That's amazing. So cool. I, I yeah. want to, um, we're going to, we're going to wrap on that one because I think it leaves us with a great challenge to go uh, take a moment of clarity and ask ourselves what is core to our business yeah, and yeah. what should we hold super open-handed and, and yeah. let others speak into as leaders. Tim, thank you so much for your time. I'm excited. I'm going to go take your survey on yeah. the, new, the new book, Eight Paradoxes of Great Leadership. And we'll put the previous two that we mentioned and your new one in the show notes. I hope you sell a million more. And thank you for your time with us today. It was awesome. Love yeah. hanging out with you. It was it was my pleasure. I feel like I'm with kindred spirits. Thanks, guys, for letting me come on the show. Give a quick shout out. What's your URL for, for people that are want to check out more about your organization? Yeah, yeah. Growingleaders.com is the nonprofit. And then timelmore.com is my uh, my site with uh, people want to book events or whatever. That would be that would be right. great. We'll get those in the show notes too. All right. Thanks, awesome. Tim. Appreciate Thanks, guys. it. Have a great All day. Right. Bye-bye.